All right, welcome to the June 24th, the Non-Credits Working Group meeting, <clears throat> 2024. Um, I've just come back from Europe, a bunch of things to talk about there. Came back with a little bit of a cold, so my throat is having fun now that I've talked all day. So we'll see how that goes. Um, a uh, reminder, this is a Linux Foundation meeting and a Hyperledger Foundation meeting. So uh, the Linux antitrust policy and the Hyperledger Code of Conduct are in effect. Let's follow those. Um, I think we know everyone. Mark, is this is the first time Mark's been on a call um, because we're doing this at a time that's not in the middle of the night for him. Uh, Mark, do you want to just that. briefly introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm Mark Moyer. I'm an architect in Oracle Labs, and my colleague Harold Carr is here too. Um, we've been working on towards defining an abstraction to enable using features, uh, particularly zero knowledge proof features with um, uh, anonymous credentials, and we are. Um, We've made some decent progress. Our um, abstraction is at this point um, targeted, but the idea for the abstraction is to separate credential formats, presentation requests, and all those kind of things from underlying cryptographic libraries. Um, and the two libraries we've concentrated on most so far are Doc Network Crypto um, and the, uh, the cryptographic pieces of the non creds 2. Um, and uh, yeah, we're making good progress and we are um, aiming to contribute something uh, to the non creds to repo, which will contain both an embodiment of the abstraction and also an implementation of that abstraction over the non creds to cryptographic libraries. Um, and uh, we've already made some small contributions of little things that we've discovered along the way, but we're aiming towards a, um, to a, towards a bigger one towards the end of the summer. We have a, um, an intern who's working with us. We've done much of our prototyping work in Haskell, and he's working with us to make that into Rust so we can actually contribute it. And um, that's cool. going pretty well. Um, and we'll probably invite him along to one of these meetings um, before the summer is out, so you guys get to meet him as well. Good. Excellent. Uh, I guess that's it, unless there's any questions. Cool. All right. Thank you. Welcome to you both. Glad to have you here. Um, <clears throat> as... Uh, any, I think everyone else is is known to everyone else here, so um, I'll jump into uh, announcements. All the conferences that I was going to, and and Mark was going, or uh, Mike Lauder was going to, are done. Um, so uh, I, I do want to bring up some some feedback from those and let people know what's happening. So. Um, I'll jump into the agenda. If there's anything, um, there's open discussion. If there's anything people want to add and discuss, um, let me know. Um, the big thing that happened last week as um, part of DICE was this um, feedback from cryptographers on the European ARF, which basically said, you guys should be using anonymous credentials. That's the bottom line of it. Um, so this issue was raised about the requirement in the ARF to do um, unlinkability and the not using anonymous credentials to accomplish unlinkability. And so that was a big result. It, it became a big uh, theme at the conference. Um, so uh, very interesting. I had actually, based on what I'd learned at EIC in Berlin a couple of weeks ahead, planned and did a session on um, unlinkability via anonymous credentials versus batch issuing. And that's the topic we talked about on this call. I basically expanded out that presentation and provided it at DICE. So, and just to be clear, DICE is IIW in um, Europe. 
So that turned out to be a good session. There was then a follow-up, which um, Jan Kamenes presented, who is, of course, the C in CL Signatures. Um, he talked about an approach that would allow the proving a, a bound hardware key to a ZKP proof, which is very interesting. Um, that would allow meeting both of the ARF's unlinkability requirements along with the requirement that the um, credentials be bound to the device of the holder, which seems like a contradiction, but we'll see how it goes. So um, that will be super interesting. Um, I don't know enough about the, um, the cryptography to do that. Um, I shared a little bit with Mike Lauder, basically some um, whiteboard notes that Jan put on the screen, uh, put on, on while we, while this was being discussed. Um, but that would be very interesting. The, they're pushing very much for a BBS um, signature solution. So that would be the way to go. Um, the, the holdup for it would be, or, or so the first step would be, actually the first step's been accomplished, which is getting some attention on doing anonymous credentials. And, and that's what the, the, the cryptographers are after and, and, and just having the EU saying, no, we don't have time, isn't good enough. And so hopefully that will trigger a, a focus for the next few months um, by some people, um, in addition to ourselves, <clears throat> on um, using anonymous credentials, whether, uh, you know, BBS-based uh, credentials with the features that we've been discussing. So that's good. Um, trying to make it align with the rest of what the EU is doing in the EU wallet will be interesting, but I think if we can get acceptance um, for this, perhaps with through the use of parallel signatures, where depending on who the verifier is, you can use um, you can use um, either a you know NIST approved um, signature scheme or a BBS based signature scheme for pr presentation. Um, that would be a provide sufficient cover for allowing implementation and the continued progression of BBS through the um, uh, the approvals process. So that was to me a, a, a very interesting thing and and will open a role, I think, for this group and other groups working on BBS. So part of what I presented a couple of weeks ago with the various groups that I've found working on BBS signatures as a way to, um, you know, bring that work together into a single um, progression forward and put it into a shape that we can use um, at the you know, issuer and wallet level versus lower level, just the sort of the signature scheme, but actually raise it up to um, the type of things that Mark, you're talking about, which is how do you actually, how, how do you get the abstraction layer to the right level that an issuer can simply issue a W3C VCDM credential that is signed with a BBS signature? Um, that's what we're after. So I'm hoping that this, um, this effort will lead to that. Uh, any uh, any comments for anyone? I have one question. This is Harold. Uh, yeah. I'm assuming whenever you say it in while you were talking, whenever you said anonymous credentials, you were talking about in general, not yes. a version one or two. Yes. Okay. And as I say, the if you read these, um, this paper here, they really, it's all about BBS credentials, BBS signatures, I mean, credentials signed with BBS um, signatures. Okay, thank you. Did you mention 
um, CL signatures in various places. They mention PS signatures, the uh, Porsche Val Sanders, and the PS uh, signatures that are quantum, post quantum. But the main focus is BBS. Um, Richard, I believe there was about a uh, hundred and ninety attendees at DICE. So it was an interesting um, three-day session with one day being a conference, <laughs> not just an unconference, and then the two days of normal IIW style unconference. Did, did you feel how do you how did it compare to going to the one in, in the Bay Area? Uh really good. There was a whole bunch of really important sessions that occurred. And so for me, it was actually a um a more important event, it felt like, than than the um than the sessions than some of some of IAW in California. It was very good. Um the big thing is so how far Europe is in implementing this, and therefore um how that converts into um you know real world examples and things like that so that's why it made it most interesting and then there was this whole discussion of uh you know having the heads of the eu eid project the swiss eid the german eid project um all together in a single room and talking to Jan Kamenisch. that's a pretty heavyweight bit of meeting really useful thanks yeah um, so I don't, um, Mike's not here. I, I assume no one has any sort of um, input onto this. I, I still don't quite understand how it could possibly be done, but um, there seemed to be an understanding in the room that we knew what was needed. And, and Jan said his team at, um, at Definity would have a definition of what they were going to do in the next couple of weeks. So two weeks, they'd have something. So that's interesting. Um, revocation manager for Alisor. Um, we have started a, um, co or a, a hyperledger mentorship. So we have a, um, uh, someone on board who is implementing a revocation manager. It's somebody from, um, uh, Victor Huang from, uh, University of Toronto, actually. Um, who had done previous uh, work on uh, an on-credits V2. So you'll see his name in a couple of PRs. Um, he submitted an application, and out of the 30-plus we got, um, was in the shortlist and accepted. So that was exciting. Uh, we started the work last week. So um, this is implementation of a revocation manager for the Allosaur um, revocation implementation. Was that, so that uh, work will begin? Is that uh, what's the name of the person, or is that a contract intern, or in how, what kind of time period? Um, he uh, so it's the Hyperledger mentorship program, and the time frame is between now and November. Um, and the idea he's doing is a combination of, to some extent, all it is is a a, a web server with a um. A bunch of the crypto uh, that's in Alisor. Um, so it's two repos, sorry. One is the Alisor Revocation Manager. That's in Agora. And then a second one that is um, basically a web server that wraps that code and provides an API for um, the issuer to let the Revocation Manager know the state of, of issuances and then for a holder to get a witness from the revocation manager in a privacy preserving way. So um, that's the, the work being done. Um, he is a, I believe he graduated and is is transitioning from grad to, or undergrad to, to, to grad school at University of Toronto. And that's Victor, right? Yes. Did I not say Victor? I think you did, yeah. Okay. Phew. Yeah. But I'd have to edit the recording and change it so I wouldn't embarrass myself. 
Um, yeah, so these topics sort of rely on Mike and he is not here, so can't. Um, we did get uh, a good look at, um, I did get some good information. I haven't had a chance to go through it from Richard on um, how dot networks implementation implements um, where the um, public key is for signing a BBS credential or a, a, a BBS credential, um, the format of the credential and an idea of how the schema works. So that's what I'm going to be looking at over the next little while um, to understand how that that works. As, as I understand it, it is a W3C BCM compliant uh, implementation based on JSON LD. Um, and the there is no cred def per se, such as there is in an on creds. It's just a did that contains a single BLS key um, or or contains the BLS key, a reference to a did with the and a reference to the BLS key within that did that signs the credential. And that the schema, as they say, is kind of built in, including how it's encoded is built into the credential. So I'm really interested in looking about, at that and how that's implemented and see, you know, how it applies. Um, the tricky part we're going to have to figure out is, is oh, Steve, get your hand up. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to ask a question about post-quantum security that um, yeah. Some some of the internals of BBS are a little new to me, um, but um, I'm I'm reading in the draft that it it claims to be post quantum secure. My question is about uh, NIST certification. Um, they have a specific set of algorithms that they've judged to be post-quantum secure that are the approved algorithms. Should we be looking more at those than some of the others we've been using? This is not a comment on which is more secure. My comment is more related to which ones are approved. So um, as I understand it, BBS is not post-quantum secure. So I'm not sure what you were reading. Um, I believe what it says is that it is, ah, oh, shoot, I was reading all the wording this morning. Um, but anyway. Well, it's got a section 6.9 in the BBS spec, if I'm reading the right one. Okay. That um, it, it has a section on, on post-quantum security, and it leads me to believe that it's, it's, safe i mean but my my question is more about like the blissful algorithms that we've been talking about i yeah. understand weren't submitted um to nist and so they're they're not part of the official what i kind of what i'm getting at is if somebody were to build with the non-creds and use the post-quantum portions that, that would address that issue then would they be able to submit it under official post-quantum certification rules? Um, unlikely, as far as I know. Should should we look at doing a version that just I don't I don't know what I'm what's entailed in what I'm asking. Yeah, exactly. We, should we do a version right. that uses the approved algorithms? I think it's a lot easier to say that than to do that. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> um, if, yeah, if people... so I have no idea how to answer that. I, as far as I know, you know, BBS is not going to be NIST certified ever because they're only focusing on on uh, on uh, specific on post quantum signatures and um, and. And 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 there and as you say, there's like four um, quantum secure signatures that NIST is looking at, and that's it. And whether they can they can be used for anon anonymous credentials, I don't know. 
Okay, that's, um, I realize that's probably a question for Mike sometime, but I think it's worth asking what, what I'm wondering about is as we create specifications and libraries, it would be really neat to have them used in uh, government operations. And yeah. those are gonna require the official algorithms. Yeah. And yeah. like I said, I don't know what's involved in, it's not as simple as just swapping one over, but um, I, th I th think maybe it might be good to put that on our list for discussion somewhere sometime. Yeah. So what this is basically saying is um, that in the post-quantum world, a, a an unrevealed data attribute would not be revealed just because someone had a post uh, had a quantum computer that they could process the proof. If they had the proof and a quantum computer, they still couldn't expose the data that was not revealed by the by the holder um however this is what i was going to say which is a a quantum computer may be able to determine the signature used to sign it and therefore an adversary could start signing um credentials on their own um, as if they were the signer, as if they were the issuer. So, and I think that's the, normally when people are saying it's post-quantum secure, it's this is what they mean. Um, so the only thing that is safe is that you you wouldn't be able to, you know, expose the unrevealed data even if you had a quantum computer. So that's the best that can be done. Oh yeah, I'm I'm good with that. That's that's why I, I hope I was clear in not saying one algorithm is inherently better or worse than the other. I'm yeah. I'm mainly looking at certification is uh, yeah, you know, for that. NIST is just not going to certify anything except ones that meet this criteria. This is the criteria mm -hmm. that people are looking for. That they that you cannot reverse engineer, if you will, the private key and therefore either be able to decrypt data or uh, that you the, the, that need the private key to decrypt or sign things based on the on the private key. And and that's what, you know, ECDSA is broken for this. Um, this is broken because with that um, level of ability. So this is no different from those other ones. Um, that said, there isn't a as far as I know, a post-quantum algorithm that NIST is looking at that will allow um, allow this capability of not being of not being able to calculate, if you will, the private key. So the the other thing to be aware of, Steve, and I've just done like product manager kind of review, but uh, NIST holds their annual competition, and I was just going through my notes the. The 2022 one had one, two, had eight uh, algorithms that yep. passed the review, of which six have been broken since 2022. So right. just because it's passed the comp, just because it won the competition, doesn't mean there's any algorithm that we have a lot of confidence in yet. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, I was looking at implementing post quantum, and I just don't think even mature enough yet. The the approach that it seems like people are talking about is combining a NIST quantum a post quantum algorithm with a traditional algorithm so that you remain because there's there's different uh, some of the post quantum secure algorithms are susceptible to a traditional computing attack. Yeah. And so how can you take the best of both and overlay them? And uh, I haven't seen a lot of really detailed uh, proposals for that yet, but that seems to be where the research is going. Well, there's um, there's two signal and also Apple's iMessages are taking that hybrid approach of layering post quantum on top of ECC, and and so that is very common in in practice to do that right now. Um, when the post quantum rules become hard and fast, and it's still a few years away, um, that's. I, it's my understanding that that's not going to be allowed. Um, and and so 
what I'm what I'm getting at is to release a product by the deadline that might use some of the libraries we're we're creating. Those libraries then in turn need to be based on specifications we're creating. And and you know, when you backtrack all of that, the I think we need to consider uh doing this right away. And I that's that's my thought is is if people are going to implement our libraries and they're going to try to sell to well at a minimum the US government then they're going to need this to be the case um that they're using the right approved algorithms that so that's that's kind of what i'm getting at is should we be considering what is on their current approved list so that we can have our libraries ready for products that need to meet the deadline. Yeah. Are you, do they have a, so I saw the list of winners for 2022 and 23, 2023, but I didn't see any of those as quote approved. Do they have a list of approved? Yeah, in April, just this past April, the commercial national security algorithm suite was announced. And, um, uh, so I have a I have a list of what they they approved. I mean things like AES two fifty six, that was good in the first place, so that just stays. Um, the Shaw algorithms they're up in the key length, and then they picked um, Crystal's Kyber for public key establishment, Crystal's Dilithium for digital signature, and um, that's. That's the ones I'm wondering if we ought to be looking at this, and it's not an indictment on, on blissful by any stretch. Um, just that these are on their current approved list. I hadn't seen that list, so thank you for the update. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sam Curran and I gave a talk at EIC specifically about this. It was it was not a cryptographer level talk it was more of an applied cryptographer from a managerial standpoint talk and um so that's the part of part of our thesis is is this if somebody needs to sell a product by the deadline and they need a library and the library needs a spec when do we in the spec industry have to start and our answer is kind of like yesterday <laughs> Um, I would add that uh, Neil John is very much a proponent of using BBS signatures and this approach. So when you said, um, and, and in particular using dual uh, or parallel signatures um, in solutions. So when you say U.S. government is not going to allow it, actually, I, I don't know if that's quite right, because he's certainly pushing for it as the way to accomplish unlikability. Oh, and then... That may turn out to be the case, but the CNSA 2.0 suite that just came out doesn't doesn't have that, at least not at this time. Um, they may change that. I mean, like um, Richard just mentioned, the, the whole reason for what Apple and Signal are doing is by, by layering the two types of cryptography, it won't be more in, any more... In, more or excuse me how am i saying this it won't be less secure than it is today and it will probably be more secure and that's that's why they're 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 doing that so they can get their feet wet with post quantum while not risking you know if if post quantum the algorithm they're using was broken but they're still underlying it with ecc then that's still going to be in the same state it was today yeah. So um, I would point out that is for encryption versus what we're doing, which is signing. Oh, that, okay. That's true. That's yeah. true. I mean, so ECDSA um, P384 is the current um, exactly. baseline requirement. And yeah. that's moving to the crystals dilithium um, on the post quantum side. Mm -hmm. um, like I say, I'm, I'm not a mathematical cryptographer, just applied. <laughs> so yeah. that's what I'm looking at is how do we 
how do we meet those requirements? And would it be good to talk about putting those in our, our current discussions? Uh, so, so my point is that with using dual signatures, you use ECDSA right now, you leave a path for doing uh, a post-quantum signature that gets approved by NIST, but for um, privacy and scenarios where NIST signatures are not required, you use um, a, a second signature on the same credential and therefore, you can choose by who's asking for the data which algorithm is appropriate, um, which signature is appropriate to use, and therefore how much privacy you're getting. If it's the U.S. government saying, "Oh, you must disclose everything and and use this signature," then you expose everything. But if it's not got that requirement, you just use a um, you know a BBS plus signature or a BBS signature. Um, And as far as um, it, it definitely, there, I, as far as I know, there's nothing we can do. It's it's definitely in the realm of cryptographers um, to figure out how to do post quantum things with uh, for the things we're talking about. Um, as as I said, it'd be I I don't uh, <laughs> I'm not against saying it, but there's nothing I can do to help. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, okay, well, without Mike, I'm not able to get any updates on the audits that we're going. I know the Blissful audit is complete and published and, and things like that. Um, I don't know how we're going to get to BBS library support. Uh, right now, it's only Mike working on it, and he has not been able to get to it as far as I know, so we haven't had an update in a while. Um, I'll check in with him, but I assume he hasn't had time. Um, I think because of this work, we may get more funding and uh, more um, focused work on being able to do things like this or whatever we think is the right library to commit to, you know, whether it's this library, um, whether it's, and as I say, it's not so much the underlying library that we're worried about as, as the how do you get it into actual end users hand at a high enough level of abstraction so they can use it um in you know in the in the libraries being uh, or sorry in the components being implemented for example in Europe being able to put them into a, a EUDI library and a an EUDI or an EU issuer and verifier so those are the big things that could come out of this effort which is funding to get um that um, raising up the the raw signatures into um, feature complete um, implementations of wallets and issuers and verifiers. Um, everyone right now is sort of working independently on those things, and and so um, we'll just see where where that effort gets applied and how. You know, that's what we're certainly looking for is where we can help to move these projects along, whatever they may be. We're not tied to any of them except just to make them successful. <laughs> all right, well, that's about all I have. So uh, any other um, open open discussion issues? Uh, I think it'd be worth taking a minute uh, since we have the time. Yeah. Uh, Harold and Mark, and I discussed the docs uh, BBS plus implementation uh, at IW with you, but huh? I don't think they were, we've caught them up in a while um, on the, if you're able to watch the recording from the May 20th call, Harold and Mark, uh, you can see where Mark Lauder and Lavesh from doc uh, discussed the pros and cons of the, of docs BBS library with the Anacreds two, uh, the current Anacreds two libraries. There are some key Differences that make it hard to reconcile the two libraries, specifically uh, the the doc is using the ArcWorks math library, uh, which is different from what Agora is using. Um, and 
uh, there were a lot of pros and cons on the revocation that that I got lost on. But uh, <laughs> anyway, that might catch you up on on some of that conversation. Uh, I'm not sure what your current thinking is, Stephen. Uh, my thought on the doc side, we are working with uh, the Credo team to to add support for Doc to Credo, and we'll yeah. see where that goes. Uh, I have also been looking a lot at the diff uh bbs plus uh effort i forgot um and i appreciate the conversation we had in the channel about the pros and cons of that uh, yeah. in the discord channel um i think but that's looks, the ccdi bbs right yes yes that's the, yeah. the effort i'm talking about so but yeah. it does look like there's uh there's not a clear path to reconcile the current doc anon creds uh, doc anonymous credentials with the current anon creds v2 code base is that a good yeah. summary where we're at yeah yeah. And as I say, I am not at any way wed to anything except being able to figure out how to add it at the level we've, you know, at the at the at the correct abstraction level, which is just, you know, here's a bunch of data, here's a credential subject, issue the credential, sign the issue credential for me, and then give it to a holder and let them get a presentation request, find the credential and and use it. So that's yeah that's where we want to get and just to uh say something from our perspective um we have not encountered any difficulties in terms of abstractions around the signature schemes themselves uh and our sort of our goal is to enable easily excuse me switching between the two applying tests to each of them individually not having to go and re-engineer you know a credential format because we want to switch signature schemes. Um, how things play out in terms of which um, uh, which schemes are approved by what bodies and what uh, technicalities there are in terms of what libraries they're based on. Not to say we're not interested, but it's not really in scope for us. We're just much more trying to uh, enable or facilitate switching between them easily and not having to think about what's underneath when you're above and vice versa. That makes sense. And that is the ideal. <laughs> Are you able to share your credential model and your, like what a credential looks like after it's signed, um, what a presentation request looks like and what a presentation looks like, Mark? Um, I would say no, because we don't have an, an opinion on those, right? We Those are for individual um, credential formats to decide what we have and can share, and, and we have shared, though it might be slightly out of date, uh, is our abstraction for those things, which are just very simple structures that um, any credential format um, or any presentation request should be able to map back and forth between them. That's kind of the, the point of them, right? Okay. Um, where we were, we've got um, publicly cleared slides, as you know, from IAW. Right, right. Um, can share pointers to what we had at that time and possibly some commentary about anything that might have changed since. Okay. Did you um are those in the IAW proceedings? That slide deck? I believe uh, uh, I um I don't know, but they're publicly available, so I can make a uh, find a pointer for you. Excellent. Okay. If you could share that again. Mm -hmm. No, one thing that I wouldn't focus too much on our credential or internal format because uh it just you know like we said it's credential dis format designers can do whatever they need to and same thing the top of the leverage do with they what they do want to do underneath and we, we're going to be able to support any kind of credential and various cryptography libraries so our actual internal formats are not really uh don't don't focus on it when you say individual credentials, you mean like a specific credential or something like the VCDM from W3C? 
Yeah, more like the VCDM or uh, non-creds version one or whatever. Just, you know, if you have a particular format and then that format has to be adhered to by an, a, a specific instance. Yeah, so we've got, when Harold's saying internal, what he means is the thing that we came up with internally just to be an exemplar, like we didn't want to go and deal with W3C and all of those things or or pick another credential format. We just wanted something really simple as an exemplar of a credential format that we would map to our um, to our abstraction, right? And so our IIW slides have some examples and they really look um, almost identical to um, to um, Java Web Tokens. Uh, we just had a requirement because we could that they they had to have some metadata that was signed, um, yeah. and we just made that as a non triviality condition for our what Harold's calling internal credential format. And he's saying, yeah, don't focus on that because um, that's not an opinion of ours that anything should look like that. It's just something that we use to test our abstraction. Mm -hmm. So those things there are in the slides, you can see like um, uh, driver's license and subscription credentials presented in that format. And I think the, the slides say something like simple format example or something like that. But yeah, that's the thing Harold's saying not to focus too much on and more to focus on the actual abstractions, which I'll point out when I share the slides, I'll point out where they are. Okay. All right. Um... So the VCDI BBS group, for example, relies completely on the fact that they're using a JSON LD credentials because they they canonicalize the the credential and then sign the canonicalized version of the data. So they are one hundred percent dependent on that JSON LD structure. So it sounds like you've taken a different approach. Well, no, we're, we've taken a more general approach that is agnostic to that issue. So they can certainly do that and map that onto our abstraction. And someone else who decides not to do that can map onto our abstraction as well. Okay. okay. And that was really a key um, sort of um, catalyst for, for our work was watching all of the um, uh, debates uh, uh, last year sometime about you know should it be jason ld should it not be this and that, yeah, that and yeah. the other and we just thought no there should be abstraction layers here that mean that we don't all have to agree on this topic because clearly we're not going to right so yeah yeah um, that's sort of the catalyst for our work starting okay all right any other issues to raise right now All right, well, I'll uh, keep everyone up to date on what I'm hearing from that group that was established uh, um, at DICE um, and uh, what Jan Kimenez reports back on of what approach he, appro uh, he proposes for that and then see where that goes. Oh, I, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, what is the, actually, it's like it's, uh, the current relationship between the code bases, I know in in the in the meeting agenda you had a pointer to Hyperledger and do search for Agora and you see libraries. So I'm curious the relationship between the current Agora libraries, the current non-creds B2RS, and wherever you're going to do the Alisor uh, revocation manager work. Um. So the the revocation manager work. Um, will be so the underlying Rust will be in Agora. The revocation manager, like the service, the web service, that'll just be done as a separate and non cred library. And it'll be done in Python as a fast API web server, and then that Agora library will be embedded within it. Does uh, that make okay. sense? It does. And and how about Agora's relationship to uh, non-creds V2RS? So there's a bunch, uh, in theory, a non-creds RS should be dependent on, on various Agora libraries. Now, right. there is not a BBS one as yet. Um, from what I understand, Mike wrote the matter 
BBS library. And, and um, I know in Hyperledger, various ones have used that. Um, but I don't, he has not said where exactly the, the BBS library would come from. And that's where I was saying, well, can we just use the doc one? Um, is that a possibility? Um, so I don't know. I, right. I just don't know enough about it. Great. Thank you. All right. Good stuff. All right, folks. Thanks all. Uh, a couple more weeks. Uh, second week in July will be the next meeting. And as I say, I'll keep everyone posted on what I'm hearing from the various um, efforts around what we talked about at DICE. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everybody, Thank you for accommodating my time zone. I appreciate that. Glad to have you here, Mark. Last I heard, I was useless at 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Bye.